We're wrapping up our introduction to graphs, and in particular, our introduction to depth first search with applications of depth first search to doing topological sorts and identifying strongly connected components in a graph. And we'll also wrap up our visit to Moku Mana, Mana in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So we're motoring around to the other side of the island here where there's a bay, and here we're going to take a look at topological sort. Topological sorts are applied to directed acyclic graphs, or DAGs. As implied by the name, a directed acyclic graph is a graph that has no cycles. It's not necessarily a tree, but there are no cycles. These graphs are good models for processes and structures that have partial orders. For example, we may know that A is greater than C and that B is greater than C, but we may not have any idea on how A relates to B. Now, even though we don't have this extra information about A related to B, we can impose an ordering on A and B and come up with a full ordering that's consistent with this information here. For example, we can decide that we're going to write A and then B and then C, or we can write B and then A and then C, as long as they both come before C. So that's the idea of topological short sort in a nutshell, where we take partial constraints on items, as shown in this example, and uh, convert them into a full ordering for the purposes of some kind of planning. The examples I'm going to give, the example I'll use here is rather small, but we should appreciate that there are significant real world applications for this. For example, I was searching for some example applications and found a reference to a paper by Henry Casanova at this university, written before he came here, but uh, where he was using topological sort to schedule 100,000 tasks on a high performance computing system. And there was also discussion of how production of 5 million pages of documents that referenced each other were ordered so that each page was produced only after the page number had been determined for all the other pages. So these have non-trivial applications. But let's go to something a little more fun here. Baseball. I actually find baseball kind of boring, but it makes, makes a good example. Uh, the idea is that there's um, prerequisite structures. Uh, well, for example, you've you got to put your socks on before your shoes, not your shoes before your socks. So that's expressed in this uh, prerequisite structure for getting ready for baseball. The algorithm for topological sort is real simple. It does assume that you're given a, a directed acyclic graph, but it's simply the DFS algorithm, depth first search, modified such that every time a node is finished, you put that node on a, a linked list and come up, that produces a full ordering. So looking real quickly here at the main uh, recursive procedure for DFS, when you set the finishing time of a vertex, you would then add it to the beginning of a linked list. Essentially, that's like a push. OK, so I'm going to run this really fast based on the demonstration I gave before. This is discovery time, and the other side will be finish time. No more. Color it black. Finish time. And we put it on the list. Similar. I think I'll stop drawing the black. Now DFS says, is there something else I haven't done yet? Uh, yes, so let's start with shorts. I'm doing it differently than in my web notes. So now it goes uh, here, 13, discovery times. And notice here that um, this is already visited, so it doesn't go there. So that's a finish time. And I may check this one out next. 23, 24, and uh, 25, 26, because that's already visited. Distinguish it from that. So this says. It's consistent with the dependency relationships here. If we put on the batting glove first, okay, kind of Michael Jackson style, socks, shorts, hose, pants, skates, leg pads. So we finished up the bottom part here, and then t-shirt, chest pad, sweater, 
and then mask, catch glove, and blocker. That's how it works. Now suppose you didn't like uh, this ordering here. You know, you really thought it was kind of silly to put your batting glove on first. Maybe you want to do that after you've done everything else because, oh, I don't know, maybe it's difficult to um, attach the chest pad. So you would model that dependency with this arrow. That would say you want to put the chest pad on before the batting glove. Now you could start, start the search from different nodes and you would get different orderings, but they would all respect the orderings that are represented in this graph. A uh, quick note on time analysis. We've already done the analysis of depth first search. All we've done here is we've added the pushing something on the front of a linked list. So that's order of one. So we're still in the order of V plus E, which is the analysis we did for depth first search. But now let's consider why this works. To show correctness, we're going to show that if the graph G is a DAG, then topological sort correctly produces a to topological sort of G. Uh, we have to figure out what that means. And it suffices to show that if UV is in the graph, then V's finishing time is sooner than U's finishing time. Well, why does this show that? Well, the link, this link here from U to V says we got to finish U before V. If U's finishing time is greater than V's finishing time, now this is a, seems counterintuitive because if the link here says you got to do U before V, then why would we want U's finishing time to be later? Well, remember that this list here was in reverse order. It was a linked list. We were pushing things onto the, the top of the list. So, for example, batting glove has the last finish time. It's the first one on the list. It's the thing we've got to do first. So if we show that for any link from U to V, the finish time of the thing linked to is less than the finish time of the thing linked from, then this is going to produce a correct topological sort. So I'm going to do this by considering what the colors are possible for U of V when we explore this edge. And for this, I want to make a little more room. So we're trying to show this. And we're going to consider these cases, the colors of U and V. First of all, U is gray, because U is the edge, is the vertex that we've just discovered this edge from. So we are in the process of exploring U. If you look at the algorithm, it has to be gray. So let's consider these cases. Can V be gray? Uh, no, it can't, because while exploring U, which is gray, if we encounter V, and it's also gray, that means that V has to be an ancestor of U. In other words, there has to be some path that goes like this by which we got to U because V is under active exploration, and that would be a cycle which contradicts it being a DAG. And that's actually a, given as a lemma in a proof. A uh, directed acyclic graph G is acyclic if and only if depth or search has no back edges. This would actually be a back edge, which we colored red in our previous tutorial, I think. Okay, so that's not going to happen. Can uh, V be white? Yes. And that is the case where it's going to become a descendant of U. So, for example, as we work down here, before we did the finishing numbers, as we work down, when we hit chest pad, sweater was white. When we hit sweater, mask was white. So it'll become descendants. And this is where the parentheses theorem applies. You'll notice that, for example, 3 and 10 wrap around in parentheses fashion 4 and 9. And because of that, this is U's finish time. This is V's finish time. U's finish time will be greater than V's finish time. And the other case is V is black. This means that we have already finished V. So this would be this case here. If this was V and this was U up here, while we're exploring U, V has already been finished. And so it's already going to have a finish time. And we haven't finished U, so U's finish time will be later. So that shows that in all cases, this constraint is respected. Therefore, topological sort is correct. The second and uh, very common application of depth through search that we're going to look at is finding the strongly connected components of a graph. This also builds on the topological sort, as we'll see in a bit. So thinking about connected components, here in the bay at Moku Manamana, we found the, an ecological connection. 
this bay is very rich in algae because of the the fertilizers from the guano from all the birds that nest on the island so it's this incredibly rich green bottom and of course there's other kinds of creatures there too such as the blue trevally and ubiquitous sharks and in the evening three teachers were telling us how they were cowering together in fear as a shark was circling around them so a strongly connected com component is a maximal set of vertices in the graph such that for all pairs of vertices in that component, there's a path in both directions, both from u to v and u to and v to u. You can get from every vertex in the component to every other one, respecting the direction of the links. You might remember weakly connected components are when you ignore the direction of the links. So this graph here is completely weakly connected. There's just one component, but it's got several strongly connected components. Can you see what they are? Well, right here, we got these two can reach each other, but you can't get out of them. So there's a component. It looks like this one doesn't have any mutual relationships with anybody, so it's alone. We can go from here to here to here, but we can't get over there. So there's another component. And then these, you can get anywhere. Not necessarily directly from, you, know, you can't go directly from that vertex to that vertex, but you can do it via some path. So that's another component. So this is what we're trying to find. Uh, these strongly connected components are important in various applications. So how can we compute these strongly connected components? Here's the algorithm. As I promised, we're going to use the transpose. So it calls depth first search twice. First, it calls it on the regular graph to compute the finishing times. So we got the finishing times for all the vertices. Now we compute the transpose. But then we're going to call the uh, DFS on the transpose with a slight modification. Rather than taking the adjacency lists in whatever order they come in, we're going to make sure that it, it considers the vertices in the order of decreasing finish time from this depth first search here. So the claim here is that once you've done this, this second DFS, the trees, the depth first force that it creates, is going to to be each tree is going to be a separate strongly connected component. So I'm going to run an example here and then I will make an argument for why this is the case. Because we're running a depth first search on the graph twice, why does the second one get us the components when the first one doesn't? So I'm going to use the example from the Corman et al text because it very nicely illustrates some things we need to see, especially when I get to making the argument for the correctness of this algorithm. So here is the, uh, a graph, and the shading indicates the strongly connected components that we haven't discovered yet, but we want to find eventually. And we run a standard DFS. The first line here is called a standard DFS. We happen to start at C. So we go one, two, three, following these edges. And notice that we've jumped into another component here. So this first DFS is not going to find the strongly connected components. Um, we finish that node, come over here, we can find this node from here in yet another component, finish that back here, over here, and back. And so that's the first search. Here's a tree. This is the tree from the first search right here. And it does not correspond to a strongly connected component. But it gives us some finish times. And then we start somewhere else. Looks like it started with uh, B here. And happened to choose going here, and then here, and back, and back. And then uh, there's no more nodes to finish. So we're familiar with that. That's the first part. But now we're going to compute the G transpose. So the transpose graph is the same graph we have up here, except that all the edges are reversed. So this edge is going this way, and now it's going this way, and this edge is going this way, and now it's going this way. And so in particular, notice that the edge that we explored in this direction now can't be explored in that direction. It's going in the other direction. Now you may remember the um, the second pass of the DFS says run it on G transpose but in reverse order of uh, largest to smallest finishing. So the largest, we start with the, the uh, node with the largest finishing and that would be B with, with 16 here. So let's start the search at B. And here we're not going to actually use the start and finish times. So I'll just you know show the search starts here, it goes over here, it goes over here. It can't get anywhere else. Now let's close that off. These are all done. And then uh, out of all the remaining nodes, who has the largest finishing time? Well, C does. So we'll start at C, 7. And notice we can't go down there anymore. But because this is a strongly connected component, even in the transpose, you can still get over there. So 
we go over here can't get anywhere else back to here we're done there now we've got these three nodes left who's got the largest finishing time G so we go 10 let's see 11 12 13 14 and then all that's left is this one 15 16 okay this search the second pass constrained by the finishing time has constructed a tree here is the tree it's constructed uh, sorry a forest forest of trees here's the trees now if you take the vertices that belong to each tree you get the strongly connected components so it works and bringing the code back in we can see you know that um, this first call is order of V plus C or E plus B uh, the transpose we have a claim that that is also order of V plus E and this is another DFS it's the same order of V plus E and this would just iterate over the vertices order of V so the overall is order of V plus E which is linear time these are just two input parameters and it's linear in the size of the graph so that's that's pretty efficient so why does it work the Corman et al textbook has a proof which is convincing but I find that after reading the proof I still need to understand conceptually why it works so I have kind of a more conceptual argument here that maybe will help make the whole thing clear first of all we need to note that um, if we have G and GT they're going to have the same uh, strongly connected components and to see the reason for this let's look at what a strongly connected component is if this is a component C then that means for any two vertices V and U in C there's some path we'll draw it like that there may be other vertices along the way P1 that goes from V to U and there's some other path P2 that goes from U to V and then if you compute uh, if you make the transpose graph all you're doing is reversing all the edges and so there's going to be a reverse path formed by the reverse edges going from V to U and, and U to V in the other direction so the transpose graph all the things that were connected to each other will be connected and the things that weren't won't be so I'm going to remove that to make a little bit of room and move on to the next observation which is that a depth first search from any vertex V in a strongly connected component C will reach all vertices in C and that is immediately obvious from the definition of SCC because uh, an SCC is something where you, you can get to every vertex, vertex from any vertex so then why can't we just use a DFS on a graph repeating on unvisited vertices to find the strongly connected components in first pass well because that's where we saw yes it would get to everything in the components you know from B we got to everything in its component and from G we got to everything in its component and from C we got to everything in its component but it also gets to other things C got to something over here and then via G gets to something over here so it gets to too much it's it's under constrained it finds all the vertices we want and more so then the question becomes how does the second pass help avoid this inadvertent inclusion so I'm going to call the inadvert inadvertently con uh, included vertex V prime and I'll call the vertex V that we're searching from say like C is an example and G is an example of V prime and we're also going to look at the example of B in a, in a little bit because either these are the two cases because of course when in the transpose graph we're gonna have an arrow from V to B and so we're going to wonder why does it incorrectly include B so how does the second search on the transpose graph help avoid, avoid the invert inclusion of V prime in C well since we're since V prime is considered the problematic vertex because we got to it outside of this component that we wanted to stay restricted to let's consider this case we started at some vertex in a component and then we found some other vertex V prime that's not in that component but this means that we necessarily had to visit some vertex in the component before this vertex here and so it's going to be prime is going to be a descendant and so by the parentheses theorem the vertex we started with in the component it doesn't necessarily have to be V it could be this one over here or some other one uh, V prime will have an earlier finishing time because we got to visit we fin we have to finish V prime and everything else over here before we finish up this component here and you can see that you know here's finishing times of four seven six and these are ten and nine so 
that's gonna, that means that in the second search, the component C to which V belongs is going to be processed before V prime, because in the second search, we always start with the ones with the higher finishing times first. So one of these vertices here will be started before that vertex. In this component, because we got to this component before we got to V prime, there is some vertex, we might call it X, that, that was visited first and that led to wandering out of the component and finding this. So in the second pass, that vertex will be explored before this one. And because G and G, G transpose have the same SCC, this search from X in the transpose will find all the vertices in the component. But in the second search, this V prime will not be reached. Why? Because we're using reversed edges in GT. Here the edge is reversed. So if V prime could be reached from uh, this from V and C, then that means you know there was an edge going that way. We've reversed it here. Now why can't we get from this component to V here? Well, if we could, there would have been edges in both directions, and so that would have made V prime part of this component C, contradicting our assumption. So due to the topological sort, the trees constructed in the second search, like these trees here, cannot contain vertices that do not belong to the SCC because in the V prime case because we got to it by an edge that has to be reversed and there can't be another way to get there otherwise they would have been the same SCC. So we already also have the fact that a DFS from any vertex in the SCC will reach all vertices in SCC and the graph and its transpose have the same SCC. So we know now we know it will find all the vertices in the SCC and it cannot find vertices like V prime that were reached in the first search, but not in the second, uh, they won't be reached in the second search. But that leaves us with one other case, B here. We did not reach it in the first search. I've done my, my conceptual proof here, arguing about vertices we not in the component that we did reach in, in the first search. But what about ones we did not reach in the first search, and in particular ones that have edges pointed back? And so why isn't this edge here a problem? That now we could have gotten from this component to this component, messing everything up. Well, that again is where the topological sort comes in. If we had started here before here in the first pass, we would have gone over this edge. But now we're considering the case where we didn't go over this edge. That must be because we processed this component first. So this is going to have a later finish time, like you see here it does, 16 rather than 10. And having a later finish time means that we would start our second pass in this component first as we did. I guess I shouldn't erase the numbers, but we started here first and found this component first. And when we find that component, because this edge has been reversed, we can't hop out of the component. So my proof shows that the two cases where it could screw up, well, here's the proof in summary. A depth first search from any vertex will reach all the vertices in C, so the problem is it might reach more than we want to reach. And so we've got to rule out two cases. We're not going to reach the ones that we did reach in the first pass, and we're not going to reach the ones that we didn't reach in the first pass, but have an edge that's reversed that would, might make it possible to reach them in the second pass. And I've argued that neither case will happen, because in the first case, if we could, if we could reach it in the second pass, then we'd have a loop, and this would actually be this, part of the same component. And I've argued that in this case, we won't do it because this edge is reversed, and this component is processed first, and you can't get over here. So it's all the topological sort that does it. I want to conclude with the concept of a component graph. The component graph is the graph we get if we turn each component into a vertex. Suppose that's a vertex, that's a vertex, that's a single vertex, and this is a single vertex. And we might call this, say, uh, C1, C2, C3, C4. So this is like a metagraph. And in the original graph, if we draw links that go between components like that, there's two links from this component to that component. We're going to collapse them into one, like that. And we have one going this way, like that. And uh, one going that way, and one going that way. This graph looks like this. This graph has to be a DAG. It has to be acyclic, because if it weren't, then you could get between the vertices and the two components, and they would really be one component. We're going to define this graph, by the way, to be called GSCC, the, the graph of strongly connected components. And so the first pass of the SCC algorithm essentially does a topological sort of this graph 
by doing a topological sort of the constituent vertices. Remember, we went on the first pass from here, and we went to here and here, and then we did that. And then the second pass visits the components of, of this uh, G transpose SCC in topologically sorted order, such that each component is searched before you search any component that can reach that component. So that was the point I was just making here about B. This component is searched before we search another component that can reach that component. Well, it was down here with the arrow going the other way. We search B before we search this one, where the green arrow, the reversed arrow, would have caused problems. That concludes our presentation of topological sort, strongly connect components, which are two applications of depth first search. And that concludes our introduction to graphs. We will have quite a bit more of graphs as we work our way up the island chain. And now it's sunset at Moku Mana Mana. <laughs>